chapters 35 through verse 43. And in fact, also, as I have up on the board, this section is uh, the 23rd um, uh, major section in the uh, chapter of Luke that we're noting uh, under point number four in the chapter of uh, uh, Gospel of Luke. But basically, this is concerning his salvation. And it, it starts in our passage, 1835, but it also goes all the way to chapter 19, uh, verse 10. So as we begin chapter 19, probably on Sunday, uh, we'll uh, continue to talk about messages regarding salvation. But this is one of those messages of salvation. It's one of the messages of our prayer life. Yeah, I was going to mention that. There's all kinds of text on that screen. I don't know what that what that means. So. All right. What's that? Oh, our computer's down, so we're not even doing YouTube. Or all right, so again, we get we're recording it, and then we'll have to uh, broadcast later. So, so the internet's down, so the internet's an issue. All right, that's why you come live, okay? That's why you come in person. You don't have to worry about technology. The volume's always good. The video's always good when you are in person. All right, but in any case. Uh, uh, so continuing on, uh, uh, we'll uh, start this topic tonight, and then it goes all the way through chapter 19, uh, verse 10, which again, we'll get into chapter 19 probably on Sunday of this week. So also to remind you that this is uh, potentially, and I'll explain this to you in a minute, potentially paralleled in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 20 and also in Mark chapter 10, just as much of chapter 18 in the Gospel of Luke uh, is paralleled to those two chapters in Matthew and Mark also. But I would say that Luke, going from the last storyline that we had noted right into this one, uh, skipped another topic line that both Matthew and Mark have in between these two uh, stories. Uh, Luke, I believe, picks that up a little bit later on, as we'll note. But remember, Luke's is not chronological, but he's giving us more of the storyline and the message uh, in regard to the work of of Jesus Christ. So let's go back and read, and then we'll come and get to the uh, specific points and precepts. In verse 35 of chapter 18, it says, And it came about that as he was approaching Jericho, a certain blind man was sitting by the road begging. Now hearing a multitude going by, he began to inquire what this might be. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. And he called out, saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who led the way were sternly telling him to be quiet. But he kept crying out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded that he be brought to him. And when he had come near, he questioned him, What do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he regained his sight and began following him, glorifying God. And when all the people saw it, they gave praise to God. All right, so that's the story that we're going to be uh, uh, noting and all the different principles and precepts and uh, unique Greek words that we have uh, in this. But remember, as I said, this is potentially paralleled in both the Gospels of Matthew and Mark, uh, but they do vary in all those, uh, all those other two Gospel accounts. And in fact, uh, Luke says, as they were approaching Jericho, but the other two says, as he was leaving Jericho, he ran into this blind man who was begging. One uh, in Matthew says there were two blind men that were doing this and crying out to Jesus. And Mark, uh, in his gospel, says that the name of the individual was Bottomias. Uh, and uh, we'll uh, ta uh, see him in, uh, uh, throughout this passage. But So Mark actually names the individual where the other two don't name him. Matthew has two individuals. Again, uh, uh, maybe uh, Luke and Mark are just pointing to one of the two individuals that Matthew is pointing out. And again, Luke says on the way in, the other two says on the way out. Now, 
Again, there's uh, potential as to why all of that could be. Uh, but basically, uh, you know, the storyline that we have behind this and the sayings of these individuals are all the same. So that's why we believe it's a parallel passage. And in the description of whether he was coming to going, it really doesn't matter too much. And again, uh, there were a lot of blind uh, people and the, uh, in the day and age, and their only source of income was to go out and beg in the streets because they couldn't hold a job or whatever the case may be. So in Jesus' ministry, as we've seen both in the Gospel of Luke and in the other Gospels as well, there were many blind individuals who were begging, and then when they saw Jesus come, they cried out to him for help and specifically for salvation as well. So when we understand this individual, again, uh, his name, as Mark has given to us, again, Bartimaeus, or Bartimaeus, I should say, Bartimaeus, is his name. In the Gospel of Mark in chapter 10, verse 46, it says a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus. Okay? And what's interesting about that is in the Hebrew, the word bar means son of. And so Timaeus named his son Timaeus, but he said the son of Timaeus who is his son, okay? So it's kind of interesting how, uh, you know, and I guess in our day and age we'd say junior and senior or the first and second or third, uh, but basically they would just say son of Timaeus, okay? So Bar Timaeus, son of Timaeus, is what that name actually means, but it's interesting how Mark says Bar Timaeus, which means son of Timaeus, who was the son of Timaeus, okay? So he double emphasizes the sonship of this individual. But again, back in that day and age, they could really focus in on who this individual was. All right, so as I said, these events happened in all three gospel accounts in somewhat of the order that we've seen in both uh, Luke chapter 18, Mark chapter 20, uh, excuse me, Matthew chapter 20 and Mark chapter 10. Uh, they all happened in somewhat of the same order. So we understand them to be parallel passages. As we look at verse 35, we're seeing the blind man, again, was sitting by the road and begging. And then we also understand that uh, where he was begging, or the city that Jesus Christ had entered, was the city called Jericho. And so I've showed you a map there. And in this map, remember, Jesus started this journey all the way up at Galilee in Capernaum in that area. And we've talked about the various uh, ministries that he had up there. He's now traveled down along the Jordan River and then came over to what we assume is Jericho, which is the old Jericho. I'll explain that in a minute as he was on his way then eventually to Jerusalem. And then what's also interesting is that we have the, uh, the town that Jesus grew up in, Nazareth, up there by Galilee or just to the west of the Sea of Galilee. And the reason I point that out is because in this passage, as we've read, Bart Bartimaeus calls him Jesus of Nazareth, as other, other uh, gospel accounts give him that title, or Jesus the Nazarene, okay? Uh, basically talking about where he grew up as a child until he reached. Uh, reached adulthood. So again, we see all of that. Now, just to give you one more historical uh, fact is that even this Jericho that they're talking about might not be the Jericho that we're thinking about, because this Jericho that I have on the map is the one that Joshua and the tribes of Israel came into the promised land by conquering Jericho, conquering that great city at that time with a great army so that they could then take over the promised land that God had given them. Again, uh, uh, Cana, as it were, or Palestine, as it's also known. So they came in and conquered uh, that city in that most fantastic way where they marched around the city for seven days, uh, you know, with uh, horns blaring and people wailing. And on the seventh day, when they came out and did that, as you know, the walls came tumbling down and then they entered the city and conquered it at that point in time and then ultimately came into the rest of the promised land. So that is the Old Testament Jericho that we know about. But what's interesting is that King Herod also had built a newer or a city during his day and age that was predominantly a Gentile city that he named 
Jericho as well. And it too was a little bit, I believe, to the east, or excuse me, the west of that current Jericho. So whether Jesus was going to this Jericho or that Jericho really doesn't matter, but he was in a Jericho, and there he met Bartimaeus, the blind man who was begging on the street and then who also asked Jesus for a blessing within his life. But going back to the original Jericho again, and in your notes, uh, remember Joshua was the one who led the Israelites as they came out of wandering through the wilderness after 40 years in the wilderness, came out, uh, Joshua leading them. Their story also made Hebrews chapter 11 the great uh, 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 passage or uh, chapter on the faithful Old Testament heroes. And in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 30, it says, By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. So again, that great episode of Joshua bringing uh, the people into the promised land made that great uh, chapter of faithful heroes of Old Testament saints. And so it really talked about the leadership and all the people who had faith during that time to do as the Lord had designed to conquer the city and enter into the promised land. All right, so that's all a little bit of side note and uh, historical backup as to uh, what's uh, going on here and what we're seeing. But as we've noted, again, it's a blind man begging. And uh, the, the word for blind is uh, to fall off, and then begging is epiteo. And uh, again, those words uh, in the Greek uh, literally mean what they uh, have in the uh, English here, blind and begging. Uh, and uh, begging, as you know, is somebody asking for arms or uh, begging for uh, some support or uh, financial needs that they might have, whatever the case may be. And they would actually uh, 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 succumb to begging because they couldn't provide for themselves in a job uh, in uh, their day and age. So the blind man here also is the analogy of what? The unbeliever who is without salvation. And remember, as I'm going to share with you in a minute, that Jesus Christ came into the world to do what? Give sight to the blind. And when it is prophesied that Jesus Christ would give sight to the blind, yes, literally, he would perform those miracles as he did time and time again. And this being another scenario of Jesus doing that, it was really a picture of what? Giving salvation to those who are unsaved. And Jesus Christ bringing the gospel message to this world who are is a world of unbelievers that need God's plan of salvation within their lives. And basically, by uh, having uh, uh, the knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ, giving that to the person who is an unbeliever, that's giving sight to the blind so that they can have the knowledge of the gospel and then come to faith for salvation. So that's the analogy that we have here of salvation, where he gave sight to the blind. It's a greater picture of his really purpose of coming into the world, as we've already noted in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, uh, in regard to God's plan for salvation. And then as Luke chapter 4, verse 18 says, as we've noted a number of different times, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives. Who are the captives? Every one of us, because we're captivated by sin or we're held captive by sin. And then it goes on to say, in recovery of sight to the blind. And again, if you think about it, Adam and the woman in the Garden of Eden weren't blinded by sin. They had full sight of who God was and what salvation was all about and what the spiritual life was. But as soon as they ate the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it blinded their soul to the knowledge of of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the spiritual life that they had was now darkened within their soul until Jesus Christ came along, as we know, in the Garden of Eden and gave them the message of the gospel once again, and they believed it, and then therefore had that sight restored. Jesus Christ came into the world to recover the sight of the blind. Again, all of us being blinded because of sin as we enter into the world. And the recovery of that sight means we hear the gospel or see the gospel and then believe upon it for our salvation. And then as it says at the end, to set free those who are 
oppressed. And again, by Satan and his cosmic system, we are oppressed if we are an unbeliever, even though we think we run the world and we have our own uh, uh, mode of operation and uh, chart our own course in this life. We're really being oppressed by Satan each and every day. And if you don't think so, just turn on the news. And you see the bombardment of negative after negative after negative after negative and, uh, and sinful way after sinful way after sinful way. It's just a total onslaught of oppression of the mind and of the soul. But when you believe in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you have the opportunity you, uh, to be freed from all of that. And in fact, you are free from it as long as you choose to remain free from it. But if you choose to go back to that sinful way and give over to the temptations of Satan and his cosmic system and give in to the fear, worry, and anxiety of the oppression that comes down to us from his world, then again, you will be enslaved to his oppression once again. But as a believer who's going forward in the plan of God, having 20-20 vision of the Word of God, both in hindsight and foresight, you don't need to be oppressed by the messages that come to you from this world because you are an overcomer and the word of God leads you in holiness and righteousness and you don't have to freak out and fear and worry and have anxiety and be oppressed and be overcome by sin and Satan and this world. That's what Jesus Christ came into the world for so that we could be recovered and have recovery and enter into the spiritual life once again. And that was prophesied all the way back in Isaiah chapter 61 verses 1 and 2. So as we understand and recognize in verse 35, that's the, what this blind man is uh, representing here, the unbeliever without salvation who is desiring to hear the gospel of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, or at least desiring to want to know how must I be saved, okay? And let's at least put it at that. Then in verse 36, it says, uh, in, in uh, going back to read it, it says, now hearing a crowd going by, he began to inquire what this was. And so in this passage, again, the blind man begins to hear. Remember, he had no sight, so he could not see the miracles of Jesus. He could not witness the person of Christ on his own and the wonders that he was performing. But he still had his ears where he could take in the word of God through the ear gate, take in the gospel of Jesus Christ through the ear gate, and ultimately receive the gospel for salvation. And so that's what verse 36 is alluding for us is that the blind man hears the word of God. They told, again, now hearing a crowd going by, he inquired, uh, began to inquire what this was. Now, let's also set the picture a little bit, too, because it was just about to be the Passover celebration. And in that map that I showed you with uh, the, the route that Jesus Christ came down from Galilee through Jericho and up to Jerusalem, many hundreds, if not thousands of people also took that route every year, and maybe three times a year for the high holidays of Israel to come down from wherever they were to the major highway and all the intersections that were there and go all the way into Jerusalem. So as this crowd was going by, he understood that it was a crowd heading to Jerusalem for the Passover celebration. And so again, he knew a little bit about the scriptures. He knew what the Passover represented, and he then was uh, inquiring Again, his senses were tickled a little bit in the ear gate, as it were, and his inquiry uh, began at that point. What's going on? What's happening? What's going on around me? I want to know. Then as we get into verse 37, they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. And again, not all unbelievers are going to be inquiring as to how must I be saved, but many of them do. And in fact, I believe at some point, and I'll get, kind of contradict myself a little bit here, but at some point in everybody's life, there's at least that thought, is there something else? And what is that? Okay, Is there a God? Is there an afterlife? Those types of thoughts. And if they are 
truly inquisitive, they're going to seek those things out and search them out. And if they truly have a heart of wanting to seek, then God's going to show them the correct information. Now, whether they believe that information or not is something else. And that's why Satan tries to bombard us with so many thoughts of evolution or anti-creationism or the Big Bang Theory that counterfeits creation. It's just a happenstance that that, uh, brought it all about. And when you think about those things, it blows the mind away how much more faith it takes to believe in that junk than it does to believe that there's a one all-powerful, all-knowing creator. It's much easier to understand and believe in that than it is a theory of evolution in the Big Bang Theory that stuff just happened to be, okay? Well, I I won't go off on a tangent. Where'd the original stuff come from for the Big Bang in the first place, okay? But in any case, they never have an end game to their, their questioning, but we do. We know what the end result is, or the beginning in this case, and we know what creation is all about. And if we can come to God consciousness, as Romans chapter uh, 1 tells us, then the next step is that God will give to us the gospel of Jesus Christ so that we can come to salvation. So, as he says here, they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. And again, this is a specific uh, 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 title that was given to Jesus, again, starting with his first name, Iesus, that uh, does mean somewhat of a translation of the Hebrew Joshua or Yeshua, that does mean Savior or uh, uh, God help us or Jehovah helps. So again, Savior is in his first name, and then Nazareth, again, being the town in which everybody thought he was from because that's where he grew up and as you know he was born in Bethlehem they escaped to Egypt for a little bit but then they came back to to Nazareth with Joseph and Mary and then he lived there until he began his ministry around age 30 years old so it was Jesus of Nazareth this was the title to identify him as different from all the other Jesuses because it was a very popular name during that time but to identify him as somebody different, but also to identify him as the Savior, the Messiah, and the King. Because interestingly enough, as we understand the word uh, Nazareth, as we have it, yes, as a town in Israel, it also uh, comes from the root word in the Hebrew called Nestor, which in, interestingly enough means branch or a shoot. And this is where we find something interesting about Jesus of Nazareth that you may not have understood before. You see, Jesus of Nazareth is more than just a town that he lived in. If we apply the Hebrew uh, equivalent called Nestor, a branch or a shoot, well, then we get to see all the prophecies that were made of Jesus Christ that he was the son of David. And in fact, the son of Jesse, who was David's father, that there would be a shoot and a branch that would come from Jesse, a shoot or a branch that would come from David. So Jesus of Nazareth would give them that understanding of fulfillment of prophecy being the son of David. And in fact, later on, this blind man says, Jesus, son of David. Okay, so it's kind of interesting that that's given to us both titles in this passage to show us that linkage between the Old Testament uh, 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 prophecy and phraseology and then also uh, the uh, birthplace or not the birthplace, but the town in which Jesus uh, grew up in. Now. Is there anything else I want to say on that? That's probably it for now. All right. So in Jesus of Nazareth, again, when they would see this, they would see the prophecy again and recognize Jesus emphasizing his humanity of Nazareth, the shoot or the stem of David or Jesse, a prophecy of who the Messiah would be, being God incarnate. So it was a name that would represent the God-man, the Savior, the Messiah, and the King. And in fact, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, it says, uh, again, she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And again, that word Jesus does mean Savior. That's why they named him Jesus. Again, Yeshua from the Old Testament down into the Greek, and again, uh, it, uh, Jesus, but also meaning Savior. He will save his people from their 
sins. So the fact is, is that he was raised in Nazareth to fulfill prophecy, as we see in Luke chapter 2, verse 39, chapter, uh, verse 51, and chapter 4, verse 16. But interestingly enough, in Matthew chapter 2, in verse 23, when you, I probably should have put it up on the board, but I didn't. But when you go back and read that, you'll say, according to the prophets, Jesus of Nazareth. Okay, And so, basically, Matthew, and he's the only one that says this, that there was a prophecy made that Jesus would come from Nazareth. Now, we don't quite know whether this was utilizing that Hebrew word Nestor as the son or root of Jesse or the branch from David, okay? And that's what Matthew was referring to. But I believe, more importantly, that it was more identifying a verbal prophecy that had been passed down through the generations of Jesus being from the town Nazareth. Because, in fact, there's no Old Testament prophecy that it says Jesus will be born, or I should say raised, in the town of Nazareth. There's no prophecy of that. There's a prophecy that he would be born in Bethlehem, but nothing that he would be raised in Nazareth. But if we take that word Nesta from the Hebrew, that could be the prophecy. But I believe there was probably more of an oral prophecy or maybe even uh, books that uh, no longer exist for us today that they might have had in their day that ultimately gave the prophecy that it would be from that town specifically. But in any case really doesn't matter. We understand what the identification is all about. We understand the title to identify him unique from other Jesuses, but also to identify him uh, as uh, the Messiah, the Savior, the God-man who would come to save us. And in fact, that title or inscription is also, as we noted uh, this past week, what Pilate wrote on the plaque above the cross of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in John chapter 19, verse 19. So again, uh, Jesus, the King of the Jews, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. So again, we see that unique title uh, given to Jesus. But uh, as he said in uh, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Then a shoot will spring up from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. And that's where we have the word Nestor. Again, uh, uh, the basis for the town of Nazareth or the naming of the town of Nazareth. And so that could be the prophecy. But we do know that the shoot or branch springing up was a great prophecy that Jesus Christ fulfilled because we see in the lineages in Matthew and Luke that Jesus does come from the bloodline of David and his father, Jesse, as well. So those prophecies were fulfilled in that sense. So again, Jesus of Nazareth, a, a, a unique uh, a title given to him to identify him as uh, the Savior. It also implied, because remember, when they talked about the town of Nazareth, you know, it was a town of reproach. Everybody thought that it was like a slum or whatever the case may be. Or, but all the bums came from that place, okay? It was like one of the worst places to live, as they thought. Can anything good come from Nazareth, as they say? And as I'll show you in John chapter 1, verse 47, chapter 7, 41, and also in verse 52, it was a term of contempt, and that's also why... Um, uh, uh, Pilate put it up on the inscription for Jesus when he hung upon the cross. So in John chapter 1 and verse 46, remember Nathanael said to him, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. And remember how Jesus evangelized and called for his disciples, uh, typically groups of brothers. Well, Philip and Nathaniel, again, uh, were uh, two that told each other about the Messiah. Philip telling Nathaniel, and Nathaniel had his doubt at first. Jesus of Nazareth is here. He's the Savior. He's the one we've been looking for. And then Nathaniel said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Okay, can anything good come from that place? Again, it wasn't a very uh, a good place to gr uh, grow crops. It wasn't very uh, industrial in, in its product and uh, uh, output there. And again, uh, who knows what else was going on in that city uh, at that time. But again, they didn't have high regard of that city, yet that is where Jesus came. And that's why also we see in Scripture, especially in prophecy of the Old Testament, he was not a man of stately form. Okay? Jesus Christ was not born onto the throne. 
He was not born in Jerusalem, okay? He was not born in one of the other lofty cities of the day. He was born in Bethlehem, again, at one of the lowly cities, a suburb of Jerusalem, and then raised in Nazareth, which was, again, the outskirts of the more populous place of the Sea of Galilee. So, again, not a stately form, which also fulfilled prophecy regarding him. So we also see that Peter referred to Jesus Christ as Jesus of Nazareth to point him out in the book of Acts, chapter 2, 4, and 10. And also the early church believers were called the sect of the Nazarenes. But that was also used as a, a, a term of not endearment, okay, but a term of content. Uh, excuse me, contempt, I should say, in Acts chapter 24, verse 5, in regard to Paul in that situation, where, again, he was the sect of the Nazarene. Jesus Christ, again, that bum that came from that place that messed up everything for us, according uh, to the Jewish religious leaders. So, again, we see the term of contempt there, as it says, for we have found this man a real pest, Talking about Paul and a fellow who stirs up dissension among all the Jews throughout the world and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. So for a time, they were called the sect of the Nazarenes. For a time, they were called the way because Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth and the life. That was another term that was given to the followers of Jesus. And then as we uh, uh, see in Paul's missionary journeys, uh, some of the Gentile people starting to call them. And that's the name it stuck. Christians, OK, followers of Christ. They were Christians. And that's the name that we carry on into today as well. But again, uh, the way was uh, one name and the Nazarenes, sect of the Nazarenes was another as well. So getting back to our story storyline, when Bar uh, Timaeus heard that Jesus was passing by, he recognized him as the Savior that he could heal. Because as soon as he, they said to him, Jesus of Nazareth, he immediately started to cry out and say, Jesus, 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 have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. So he recognized instantly who Jesus was just by the name and then ultimately knowing what he could do. In other words, he immediately had absolute faith in the person and work of our Lord and Savior, his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's an important part for the rest of the story as Jesus Christ then heals this individual from his perpetual blindness that he had. And remember, as I've said to you before, back in the ancient day, if something bad happened to people, like being stricken with blindness or even from birth, they would typically think, well, you must have sinned or your parents must have sinned. So they thought being blind was a negative thing, a disciplinary thing from God based on being a wrong, evil, wicked, or sinful type of individual. But as Jesus came along, he proved them all wrong. And in fact, here's one of the tie-ins to our, uh, previous uh, uh, passages in the chapter where the rich young ruler... Remember, he had all the riches in the world. Well, back in the ancient day, they thought if you were rich and had authority like that, you were being blessed by God. For sure, you must be a good person because you're being blessed. But yet the blind guy over there, no, he's a bad person or his family is, and therefore they're stricken with that illness because of their sin. And that's how they looked at society as good or bad based on the wealth that they had uh, at, their, uh, at, at their call or not. And again, we kind of even see that in our day and age as well, too. And as the book of Proverbs says, everybody loves a rich man, okay? But a poor man, uh, who gives a hoot about that individual, okay? But in any case, we see that uh, in this case, we see the blind man believed in Jesus the Messiah, and then, as we're going to see later on, followed him. At the very end, it says he followed him. And here's a man that was stricken by sin, according to the thought of that day. But yet the rich man, who had all the goodness in the world, kept the law, done all that stuff, he did not do what? Follow Jesus Christ. So it's really not what the outward appearance is and the material possessions that you have, but it's what's going on in the heart of your soul. The rich young man didn't have a good heart, and he loved his material possessions more than he loved God. The poor man... 
He loved God more than anything else and recognized that Jesus was the Savior, was the Messiah. So he cried out for Jesus. He recognized him as the Savior and that he ultimately could heal him. So as we look at verse 38 now, it says, And he called out, saying, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. So once again, we had Jesus of Nazareth, which emphasizes saviorship, but also his humanity, as we've talked about in the past. Now we have the phrase son of David, again, giving our link to Nestor, again, from the branch or the shoot of Jesse or David, as other scriptures say. But we have Jesus, weos, the word for son in the Greek, and then David or David, as we would say, and again, in the Greek and in the Hebrew, again, the D and the V are the same letter, and they can pronounce based on uh, 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 whatever the other characters are around the, uh, the, the letter in that case. So David or da David is what we would say uh, in the English here. Uh, it's the son of David. Now that was absolutely messianic phrase being the son of david they were all looking for the son of david they knew that there was a prophecy that david would have a son that would sit on the throne eternally they knew that there would be a kingdom eternal and that the son of david would be their eternal king but not only just king in the human sense but also their savior and their messiah so again this really puts it together not only jesus of nazareth but Jesus, son of David, as this individual then takes Jesus of Nazareth that he heard and then converts that into Jesus, son of David. Again, nobody told him Jesus, son of David, but he knew that information because he had been listening to preachers and teachers prior to this point in time, and he believed in who and what Jesus Christ was as the Savior, the Son of David, the Messiah, the King, again, recognizing his humanity, but also his deity as the Savior king and what did he ask for have mercy on me again he knew he was in a wretched place he knew he, he had blindness he knew he couldn't provide uh, for himself because he did not have sight uh, he was there in the streets begging for whatever scraps he could uh, uh, gain at that point to survive uh, day by day and again he asked for mercy upon him now, in this, yes, we could look at the literal blindness and the uh, poorness that he had and looking to rectify that, but more importantly, by analogy, we recognize that have mercy on me is the cry that all who have sin upon their soul ask God for. Have mercy on me. In other words, forgive me of my sin. That's really what's in view here have mercy on me. It's really the analogy of asking for the forgiveness of sin for salvation. So even though we have the literal storyline of a blind man uh, you know, who was poor asking for mercy, it's really the analogy of the unbeliever crying for forgiveness of sin for salvation. And then Within all of this, and as we uh, uh, see coming back on Thursday night, and I'm not done yet tonight, we've got a few more minutes left, but as we come back on Thursday night, we're going to be really seeing even more principles because, as I said in the outset, all of this really has to do with our prayer life. It's really talking about our prayer life. This is being acted out in front of us, and it's giving us principles and precepts of how to operate in our prayer life, which harkens us back to who? The widow, remember the widow who asked the judge to defend her, defend her, defend her? Hopefully you can remember that. I know it was like months ago when we studied that, okay, uh, in the early parts of chapter 18. Okay, it wasn't that long ago. But again, remember how we talked about her requesting of the judge and some protection. And now that was a storyline of how we should be operating in our prayer life. Well, in this blind poor man we see the same things and so it's tying us back to those passages in scriptures as well so we see principles in regard to our prior life that we're going to uh, be speaking to now going forward so again a cry for forgiveness of sin and again the prayer of the unbeliever is what jesus forgive me of my sin and thank you for coming and paying the penalty for my sin 
Because that's what Jesus Christ came to do. And when you believe on the name of Jesus Christ, it's not just believing on uh, Jesus Christ who's the neighbor down the street, okay? You're believing in the person who came 2,000 years ago who went to the cross and died for your sins, paying the penalty for your sin. So to believe on the name of Jesus isn't just saying, I believe in the name of Jesus, okay? No, you're saying, I believe that he died for my sins, and through him I have the forgiveness of my sin. And so have mercy on me is kind of that short phrase of crying out for the forgiveness of sin. And it's interesting that Jesus responded to the man when he said, Jesus, son of David. Jesus responded to him and then answered his request or his prayer, as we see in the rest of the story. And by Jesus responding, Jesus, son of David, he basically was uh, signifying that that's who he was, the son of David, which signified that he was the Messiah, he was the Savior, and also he was the king of the people and nation of Israel and really of the entire universe. So uh, it, the messianic title was applied to him by Jesus responding to what the blind man had called him, Jesus, son of David. And so when Jesus asked him again, uh, well, we, first he cries out to Jesus. His prayer petition for Jesus was to have mercy on him. And again, forgiveness, grace, Elio U, uh, is uh, what's in view there. And remember, mercy is everything that God does for the sinful man. That's what the word mercy is, okay? Again, everything God does for the sinful man. Grace, on the other hand, can encompass that, but it's really everything that God does for man whether it be the positive believer who's going forward and God able to bless them, okay? or whether it's the forgiveness of their sins post-salvation when we confess our sins. Grace encompasses it all. Mercy is something different. It's something for the downtrodden. It's something for those who are held in bondage. It's uh, for those who have sin upon their life. Okay, Have mercy on me. Help me out in this situation because I am in need of help. That's what mercy is all about. And Jesus, uh, so his prior petition, again, that he had, again, petitioning for himself, is that he recognized that Jesus was the Messiah, the Savior, God, who could do these things for him. He recognized it, and therefore he asked for these things, as we see in the coming verses and coming up. Now, uh, in the uh, Christ-centered exposition, it's a, uh, just to give you a little commentary in your notes as well, it says the beggar was not present in the private meeting uh, Jesus held with the disciples back in verse 31 and 34. So we did not know Jesus had used another messianic title there called the Son of Man that comes from the book of Daniel, chapter 7. It says the disciples with the private study could not see it while the blind man sitting by the street saw perfectly... And he prays, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. So again, if that went by you too quick, let me just give you a little explanation, okay? So remember in verses 31 through 34, they had no comprehension. They had no understanding. And the message that Jesus gave them, they were blinded to that message. And we talked about that on Sunday, how they blinded themselves through negative volition, okay? As the Son of Man, another messianic title was given to them. They were scratching their heads and saying, what are you talking about? What do you, you, know, what do you mean all this stuff that's going to happen to you? They had no comprehension, no understanding, and it was he uh, held from them because they, again, hid it from their own soul. But now we see a blind man, okay, <laughs> who has 20-20 vision as to who Jesus Christ is. So those with sight had no idea who Jesus was, as it were, okay? But the blind man had 20-20 vision as to who Jesus was, and he said, have mercy on me. And then, as we know, Jesus Christ asked him, what do you want? And then he restores his sight. So now as we turn to verse 39, in verse 39 it says, Those who led the way were sternly telling him to be quiet. But he kept crying out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And so once again, as we saw back in the storyline of the widowed woman in verses 1 through 8, who is petitioning the judge for defense, 
Again, what did she do? Have persistence. She requested over and over and over again until the judge gave in and answered her request. And we ought to do the same in our prayer life as well with God. Keep praying over and over and over again, persistently and vehemently, until you get an answer definitively for your prayer request. Whether it be yes or no, and we've talked about that. You all know yes and no uh, scenarios in regard to uh, answered prayers. So be persistent, because this man was. Yet the people were saying, shut up, shut up, shut up. Keep quiet. Keep your mouth closed. You know, don't say anything. You You know, go away, okay? They're trying to shoo him off. But he became more persistent, as he should have. Just as you and I are to be persistent in our prayer life, especially in the light of opposition. And aren't there a lot of people in our world today that are saying to the Christians, shut up, go away, don't talk, we don't want to hear from you. And in fact, they flip it around and, you know, there's a whole political party that are genius at calling, you know, those who are doing bad, excuse me, those who are doing good, bad. And those who are doing bad, which is themselves, good. Absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing how they use this tool now and they flip it around. And they are doing it to the Christian more and more each and every day. And we are the haters. We are the ones that are wrong. We are the ones that don't, you know, know what is right and wrong. Yet they do. And they have all the wisdom and they have all the knowledge. They're the good ones and we are the bad ones. And again, if our nation continues in its negative volition towards the Word of God, that will get worse and worse and worse. But again, if we have a revival and we recover and uh, uh, more positive believers come up, that could change too. Okay? And that's why we have to get out there and speak more vehemently and more boldly about the Word of Christ. And don't allow the naysayers who are telling you to shut up to shut you up. And don't worry about what they think. Did the blind man care what the people thought about him when he was crying out to Jesus? No. He just wanted to be with his Messiah, and he wanted to have a relationship with his Messiah, and that's what it was all about. And that's what you and I need to do as well. Just keep having that relationship with the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and keep petitioning him even in the face of opposition. Now, we also see... And this will come up uh, in the next verse a little bit. But remember, there's a crowd of people saying, you know, telling him to be quiet. All right. Don't disturb Jesus. Leave him alone. Now, we could give him the benefit of the doubt by them thinking that the beggar, you know, the poor, the blind poor man who was begging is just looking for money. OK, so. We'll give him the benefit of the doubt and say, don't bother Jesus. He's got more important things. It's not about material things. It's not about money and, you know, what you're going to get in your little cup, tin cup today, okay? And if that's all you want, you know, leave us alone and be quiet. Leave Jesus alone. He's got more important things to do. But Jesus knew that was not his heart, okay? So giving them the benefit of the doubt, that's maybe why they were shushing him away, all right? But what we see in the next verse, what Jesus Christ does also harkens back to the earlier portions of our chapter. Remember the little children wanted to come to Jesus and the disciples saying, leave them alone, leave them alone, leave them alone. And then Jesus gave the lesson, let them come to me. And then we see the greater lessons throughout the New Testament uh, 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 Gospels that, you know, anyone who harms one of these individuals, it'd be better for a millstone to be hung around its neck than to stop them from coming to know the Messiah. Okay. So again, we saw that message early on in our chapter. That's coming back into play, too. So again, this storyline is a summation of really the entire chapter, but just with a different storyline. So as they were trying to hush this guy up, telling him to go away, be quiet, he did the right thing because he knew about his relationship with the Lord and he wasn't going to let anybody shut him up. And instead, he became more vehement in regard to his cry and became more vehement, as I would say, in his petitionary prayer to God. 
just as you should be more vehement in your petitionary prayers to God, especially in the light of any opposition that you might have, especially if you want to witness to somebody, if you want to go you know, perform some kind of uh, a, a, a mission uh, within your church or outside your church, if you want to start something new or go off in a direction to get the gospel out there or get the truth of the word out, and you're having everybody telling you no, 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 or don't do that, don't waste your time, don't bother, we don't have time for that, or whatever the case may be, whatever that opposition might be, that's when you pray even more vehemently to God, saying, God, if you want me to do this, clear the road. You know, pave the road, because, you know, I'm getting all this opposition. I'm getting all these bumps on the road. And now I need you to smooth it out for me so that ultimately your will will be done. And he will do that if you have that vehement persistency within your prayer life. All right, so then here's where Jesus uh, Christ rebukes the crowd. Where in verse 40 it says, And Jesus stopped and commanded that he be brought to him. And when he came near, he questioned him. So persistency in prayer catches God's attention is really the uh, main focus of this passage because he cried out, Jesus, you know, uh, uh, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And in the Greek, it really emphasizes he got louder and more bold as he cried out. And that caught Jesus' attention. If he just said, Jesus, have mercy on me. Jesus probably would have walked by because there's a lot of crowd noise going on, okay? Jesus, have mercy on me. Jesus, have mercy. Have mercy. Okay? A lot of crowd noise going on. wouldn't even hurt him, okay? But because he was so vehement and persistent, it caught Jesus' attention, and ultimately Jesus then did something in response to his prayer petition. So again, God knows your heart, okay? So that's another principle of prayer we have to understand so you know uh, god knows what your uh, you know what your uh, desires are to fulfill his will and plan for your life but again even with that even though god knows your heart he wants to hear from you and he wants to hear persistently from you so let's do that and again if we don't have immediate answer to our prayer be persistent until you get the answer to your prayer. So then when it says Jesus stopped and commanded that he be brought to him, as he says, bring him to me, this basically was a subtle rebuke to the crowd. <laughs> Why are you telling this guy to shut up? Bring him over here. Get him over here. He's crying out for me. He needs help. Let's do something about it. And once again, Jesus has to rebuke, you know, the disciples and, you know, whoever else was, uh, you know, not just the 12 at this point, but probably the whole crowd that was with him had to rebuke them all. What are you thinking? You know, this guy needs help. Let's help him out. He's crying out. He identified who I am. You said I'm Jesus of Nazareth. He said Jesus, son of David. Put two and two together. He knows I'm the Messiah. I'm the Savior. Let's bring him here. So he actually commands the people to go get him. And bring him, bring him forward. It's kind of interesting. And again, they all had to kind of put their tails between their leg. And, oh, I guess we were saying the wrong thing. And he made the ones that were saying, shut up, guy, shut up, guy, shut up, guy, go get him. Oh, Jesus actually wants to talk to you now. Okay. So again, a little rebuke to them, a little discipline there. Hopefully they learn from that. But, you know, similar to what we see in verses 16 and 17 where the disciples were hindering the children from bo bothering Jesus. So we see the tie back uh, in our chapter. So what we take away is that in our prayer life, we are to also get close to God and draw near to him. So Jesus stopped by his vehement prayer, persistent prayer, caught Jesus' attention, stopped him in his tracks, okay? Jesus then commanded that he be brought here, rebuking those who were saying, shut up, shut up, shut up. And then when he came near, notice that Jesus didn't walk over to him, okay? But that man came to Jesus. See, very important part. See, we have to come to God in the petitions of our prayers. God's always there. God's always ready for us. God's always around us, okay? But we have to adjust the mentality of our soul away from the world and away from individualism and self and uh, egotism and leave ourselves behind and do what? Draw near to God. That's what we have to do in our prayer life. Draw near to Him. And when we draw near to God, as we know, he hears our prayers and he answers our prayers. And again, as we close tonight, I'll show you those two passages. But again, an important principle of prayer is draw near to him. 
Because if we don't draw near to him, first through the confession of our sins, so he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And again, I love the people who think you don't have to confess your sins. You can just bring all your garbage to Jesus. And here it is, all my muck and mire and sin. Okay? And deal with me with my sin. Okay? And even though I'm sinning it up, you know, answer my prayer. Okay? No, we've got to draw near to him. Confess your sin. Draw near to him. And when we do... It says, this is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And as it says in verse 15, and if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests which we have asked from him. See, the word, a uh, unique word in this passage is what? Confidence and then the word no. All right? Confidence is... And the word know for knowledge, knowing, means what? Faith. You see, that's faith. You see, when you know what the Word of God says, and then you have confidence in it, which means you apply it, that is faith. Faith isn't this other mystical, miracle thing over here. Okay? How do I get faith? How do you get faith? Know God. And then have confidence in Him. That's it. But if you don't know God, you've got nothing to be confident in because you don't know him. You can't be confident in God if you don't know him. And then even if you do know him, if then you say, well, I don't quite believe it. I know the information. I know what I should do, but I'm not going to do it. I don't believe Whatever the case, that's not confidence. Confidence is saying God hears my prayers. God answers my prayers. Therefore, I'm going to say the prayer and I'm going to wait for the answer of God because I know he's going to answer it. Absolutely. Because the word tells us. So it's just acting upon the word. That's all faith is. Acting upon the word of God. This man had it. Jesus have mercy on me. And then when he drew near to God, then as we're going to see coming back on Thursday, Jesus says, what specifically do you want? You know, mercy is a big word, but what specifically do you want? And so when we come back on Thursday, we'll talk more about what do you want and the specifics that we ought to get into in regard to our prayer life. All right, so let's close there. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for this principle in regard to salvation in our prayer life. And we ask that we all gain more confidence in our spiritual walk each and every day by learning your word more and more and applying it uh, persistently and consistently as we trust in you. So, Father, we thank you for this time. We ask for travel blessings on our way home. In Christ's name, amen.